Take your Bible. Turn to Judges chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 4. Man, appreciate the good spirit that's here this morning. Ready to get into the Word of God. God laid this on my heart uh, earlier in the week. And um, I don't know why I'm preaching it other than I feel like God's leading me to. And um, if this gets you, good. Okay? If something I say, the Holy Spirit gives me, something I say just kind of scalds you a little bit, I'm going to say praise the Lord because we need it. Okay? So um, I've been, my anticipation or what I want is to be able to preach through the book of Judges. And um, when, I, when God laid a certain issue on my heart, I was able to go right back to the book of Judges, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and see that exact same thing there. So I'm going to try to tie them together. You pray for me as, as I preach this morning. Pray that God will lead. Pray that God will minister. Pray that God will move in our hearts, all right? Uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 14. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Now I want you to think about who Israel is. Let's say that our church now is Israel. <laughs> Okay? And that's, that's Bible, that's biblical, okay? that God has called us, he's elected us, and so on, but we're Israel. Have you ever had the anger of the Lord hot against you? It is not fun. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them to the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Verse 15, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up what? Judges. There's a verse in the Bible that is the devil's favorite verse to use. Judge not. Now, he don't like the rest of it, and he don't like the context it's in. He don't like the rest of the Bible, but that's one of his... Because any time somebody is talked to about their sin, about their lifestyle, about how they do it, they revert back to this one piece of verse that the devil gave them, and they say, well, judge not. You're not supposed to judge. God raises up judges. To you, this whole Bible is your judge. Because what's going to happen is, at the end of your life, there's not going to be a game show called This Is Your Life. You're going to have to stand before God and be judged by this book. So if you don't like this book, you think there's errors in this book, you don't think the Bible is really the Word of God, that it may contain the Word of God, or whatever your view of the Bible is, does not matter. This Bible is going to judge you. Okay? The Lord raised up judges, which, look at the purpose of the judge, to deliver them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. If you've ever heard a message by me, Mike Hutzel, Reg Kelly, any, anybody else, if you've ever heard a message and God used them to get at you over things that you have done. You got two responses to that. You could either be mad and say, well, I'm not going to listen to them ever again. Or you can do what the judgment was intended to do, and that is to deliver you out of the hand of your enemies. That's why God will judge you. This is why we need a cross for salvation. Without the cross without you understanding that you are guilty as charged. God Himself, the Bible judging you, your own conscience judging you. Without that, there is no salvation. There's no salvation without sorrow. There's no salvation without repentance. None. So the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled Him. Yet they would not hearken unto their judges. Now watch that. You look at that. You know what they said? You're not supposed to judge. You can't judge me. I think what I'm doing is right. So the, uh, they would not hearken unto their judges, but they 
went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with that judge. Are you, got, are you catching that? Who's, who's, who should judge you? God. Will he? You better believe it. When the Lord raised them up judges, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. You might underline that word stubborn in the Bible and then write your name next to it. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Israel's enemies are God's enemies. The Canaanites, the Philistines, the Hittites, all those people in the land of Canaan, they are not only the enemies of Israel, they are the enemies of God. They hate the one true God. They serve these other gods, these false gods, and they hate God's people. So, now watch this. Here's God Almighty. And he's got, he, he's got His group of people, His sheep over here. And He's got the devil's crowd, all the goats, over here. Now we, we know, according to the Bible, that God is going to destroy these goats. They're going to be punished with everlasting punishment in the, the lake of fire for all of eternity. And think of the enemies here in Judges chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, that they're the enemies of God. God is at some point going to take those enemies and destroy them because they hate God. The wicked, the Bible says, shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That's who's going to hell. God, and you listen to me, if you are lost and you're just listening to me so you can poke fun at me, and so you can say, oh, Mike Hoggart, he's a bigot. He's this, he's that. I don't like him. If you're watching, I want you to know I am not your judge. I do not want to be your judge. I don't think I ever, ever want to see anything in your life that I would say, boy, I think that's wrong. You don't have me to worry about. It's God you need to worry about. But all you lost, wicked, hell-deserving sinners that are not saved, I'm going to put you over here on the side for a while. And you read Judges, you read this passage again to yourself and ask yourself the question, here's all these enemies, why isn't God destroying those enemies? Why is God dealing and being so mean to His own people? There's a reason why. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and I'll tell you. Father, I need your help to preach. Lord, this is a necessary message. I need it. And Lord, if nobody gets anything out of this today except me, I, it'll be worth it. Because I need it. I need to remember some things that I forget. Father, I, help, I pray that you'd help me preach today. May the Holy Spirit work in me, work in these people, work in those folks online. A, a mighty work and establish us as your people. But God, if we're your people, there's a way you expect us to live. And nine times out of ten, God, we don't do it. God, please do not let us go and live the way our wicked flesh thinks it wants to live. Chastise us. Rebuke us. Put a stop, put a, put a as, as in Balaam, put that donkey in our way and not move anywhere. And Father, we just ask God that you help us today, help us to see ourselves before we start seeing everybody else. And I pray, Lord, you'd use this message the way you had intended. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. So God's got these enemies, Canaanites, Hittites, Philistines, Philistines all through the Bible. 
all through the Old Testament. Philistines hate God, hate God's people. They got Goliath. He's their champion. He's going to, he curses God and this and that and the other. He's a type of the beast is who he is. And yet God is not worried about the lost crowd right now. He has something that in his eyes is far more important to deal with. And that is, listen to me, it's his own house. Before God is going to lay a finger against the wicked, he has got to straighten up and settle his own house. You getting what I'm saying? Turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 4. Turn your Bibles there. Just because I worked and labored and slaved to put these verses up on the screen for you, you get your Bible out and read it. Underline it. Make notes. Show, hey, uh, show them your, Ron, show them your notebook there. When I was in high school and college, I, I got a certificate for being the world's worst note taker. It was called a D minus. That's what I got. <laughs> when God started showing me, that it, and it, God reminded me the other day, it's 20 years ago this month that God started dealing with me about studying prophecy. 20 years ago this month. And when I started doing that, Ron, I started taking notes because I would forget things easily. Amen? I forget things easily. So I And I've got all my notebooks, and I've still got some. I make new notes. I see things in the Bible. I want to write it down so I don't forget it. Uh, take some notes. Okay? Underline this in your Bible. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Are you there? Say amen. For the time is come. When is that time? It is right now. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them what shall be the or what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, look at that, look at how he worded that. Scarcely be saved. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. Jeremy and Laura, that's exactly what we just did. I did not make any guarantee or promise to you that you're going to be delivered from epilepsy. You're going to be delivered from the maladies that I know you have. I did not tell you one thing about, oh, that, oh it's God, uh, God's going to heal you. He has to. I did not tell you that. What I told you is that we're going to commit your suffering to the hand of the Lord. And we're going to let God have it. And God's good. So... Let's, let's just say this. Maybe you're suffering because you deserve it. Maybe you're suffering because you had it coming. And you don't, you don't like being dealt with that way. And you kind of rebel a little bit against that. I would advise you not to do that. I would advise you to read Hebrews chapter 12 and take the chastening of God. Or God will use a dirty word after you. You go read it. Find out. But God has got to deal with us first. How, how, how far advancing is the sodomite agenda right now in this country? It's everywhere. Everywhere. Even in churches now. Open sodomy in churches should God judge them is God going to judge them and it's not going to be good is it who are you it is not right and righteous and fair that God skips over us and goes after everybody else you know what we call that political favoritism cronyism Somebody gets elected to public office and all of a sudden all their family members are holding jobs while the other people who've been working there 20 years got thrown out. We would cry and say, that ain't right! Amen? Congress. Who remembers back, what was it, the 90s? When Congress got caught, these congressmen got caught writing bad checks all over Washington, D.C. They were getting away with it. 
Because they felt like the laws didn't apply to them the way it applies to us. Or Obamacare. How the Congress, in their wisdom, said everybody is going to have Obamacare shoved down their throat except us congressmen. We're exempt from it. What ticks me off, doesn't it? So we don't accept this in the political realm. Why should we be any different when it comes to our church? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Now, I want to go back now to Judges chapter 2. Now, I'm going to say this very quickly. I'm going to try to move fast. Okay, It's already 10 till. And I'm hungry. You look at this. The anger of the Lord was against Israel. And God raised up judges. Those judges, their job was to administer the laws of the Word of God equally and fairly to every Jew in Israel. No exceptions. If this person stole a, stole a goat, and this person over here stole a goat, but this person over here is related to so-and-so who holds a high position in the court, and so this person over here who stole a goat, we're just going to let them get by with it, and they can keep the goat. But this person over here, because they don't have connections, and their family line is poor people, and they don't, they don't really, uh, they, they don't, they're kind of an embarrassment to us, uh, high-ranking high Jews, and so we're going to throw the book at them. They're going to lose the goat. We're going to put them in servitude. We're going to give them lashes. So one man commits a sin by stealing a goat. Another man commits a sin by stealing a goat. And yet this guy over here gets nothing done to him while this guy has to suffer. Is that right? No. If, it, if she did it and she did it, they both are wrong. And they have to be judged. Amen? Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 9. I want to show you this in real, real life. Ezekiel chapter 9. Turn your Bibles there. In fact, I'm going to play a trick on you. That's get, getting smaller by the second, isn't it? There you go. Read that one. Ezekiel chapter 8. God took Ezekiel by, by the Spirit and took him into the, the temple of, in Jerusalem. And every place that God showed Ezekiel, he saw abominations going on inside of the temple. It wasn't outside. God was saying, Ezekiel, come with me. I want to show you what, I want to show you what the religious crowd in Jerusalem is doing. They were worshiping idols. They had all sorts of abominable and maybe even vulgar displays inside of the house of God. And the higher up that Dan, or Ezekiel went in the chain of command, the greater the abomination was. You know what that is? That's spiritual wickedness in high places. How many believe that in the highest realms of Washington, D.C., there is nothing but pure wickedness? Jefferson City, Jefferson County. Okay? Same applies and exists every, in the tops of a lot of these denominations is a lot of very evil, wicked things going on. Okay? And so here, God showed Ezekiel all that in Ezekiel chapter 8. Then in Ezekiel chapter 9, this is what God's going to do. Verse 1, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them to have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a rider's ink horn by his side. You know what that is? It's a horn, literally like a goat horn, and it was filled with ink. He probably had a little quill pen attached to it. He was some kind of scribe, I guess. And here's what he showed up. God called him and he showed up. Now, six guys show up and they got a sword in their hand, and God's fixing to send them out with that sword. God is in a killing mood. When God has had it, He'll start taking people's lives. How many of you know that? So watch this. And they went in, uh, this verse 2, they went and stood beside the brazen altar. Verse 3, And the glory of God, of the God of Israel, 
was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Let me tell you what that is. That's not the mark of the beast. What it is, it's a prefiguring of the seal of the Holy Spirit. We are In Revelation chapter 7, the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be sealed in their foreheads. They're going to have the seal of God in their foreheads. And that is the same thing you've got now. You, you are, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Set aside by God. Because when we see the wickedness that is in this world, when we see the wickedness in our own families, when we see the wickedness in ourselves, we mourn. We weep over it. We want God's righteousness. God, I want to be right with you. God, I want to live right. And it makes us weep over what we're seeing going on. That's because God has sealed you and set you apart. So this guy with the writer's ink horn, he's supposed to go to the people in Jerusalem that are weeping over the abominations that are going on in the temple of God. Because they have a zeal for God's house and they think God's house ought to be right. So the writer's ink horn goes and he puts some kind of little mark upon these guys' forehead. Once that's done, listen to this. Verse 5, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. So the guys with the swords are going to go out in the city and everybody who does not have the seal is going to get killed. God is executing judgment over wickedness. Mark it down. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You believe that? Oh, well, I'm saved. So that, that's not for me. That's exactly, that is exactly who it's for. So they're going to go through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare. This is verse 5. Neither have you pity. Verse 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And look at the next phrase. Where is he supposed to start? Begin at my sanctuary. Don't go out to the scuzzy part of town where they deal in drugs all the time. Don't go over here to the site where all the pool halls and the liquor joints and everything else is. Don't go over here to the, uh, to the other places. Uh, oh, they're sinners. They're bad. We need to get that out of our town. Bless God. No, we're going to start in the sanctuary. We're going to work our way out because judgment has to begin at the house of God first. So watch this. Slay utterly, well, I read that, begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. There's a very hierarchy, very top hierarchy that's in Jerusalem. The leaders, the religious slash political heads that are in Jerusalem, they are the ancient men and those guys went in and slaughtered every one of them. And now look at what God said. Uh, then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said to them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go you forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Look at what God is saying about his own house. He's not saying, now lead them gently. Get them out of the, get them out of the temple. And let's kind of take them to like a, a, a secluded place. Because we don't want everybody in Jerusalem finding out what's been going on in their own temple. Why, that would create a scandal. We, we, we wouldn't be able to handle that. We better cover this up. That's not what God said. God said, if they're in the tabernacle, if they're in the temple, if they're in the sanctuary, kill them where they stand. Let the blood of the wicked people be poured out in my house and defile that house. Why? They already defiled it with their actions. You get what I'm saying? And I, I, I know the rules here in this church. I was taught the rules for coming into this room. You don't bring a soda pop in here and sit down and guzzle soda pop in church. Leave your coffee out in a foyer or leave it out in your car or wherever, but don't bring your coffee, your snacks, your soda pop don't be sitting there while I'm preaching, acting like you're reading your Bible. You're watching YouTube videos. This is the house of God. And I was taught right. 
But let me tell you something. Some of you would throw a fit. Somebody coming in here with a big gulp, eating nachos, sitting down here to church while we're having church trying to pray, they're going, <laughs> Well, that ain't right. We need to get that out of here. And yet those same people dared to walk into this house in the presence of Almighty God with the sins that they've been doing all week. Unconfessed, unrepented. Who are we kidding? We come in, in fact, that's a lot of times that's a big spiritual cover. Oh, look at it. Oh, young man, we don't come in the house of God dressed like that. Young lady, we don't drink our soda pops in God's house. We don't chew gum in here because that gum could get on the carpet. That would defile this house. And we're doing that to cover up some really nasty, bad stuff that we've been doing. And it ain't right. Am I going to get an amen out of somebody? Amen. Let me read some verses real quickly. Don't, uh, you can keep up if you want. Psalm 7, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. David said, God, I want you to judge me. God, look at me. God, I, I listen, I already know the wicked, they're defiled, they're going to hell. But God, look at me. And if there's something in me that is not right, God, you drive it out with your rod. You tell God that. Verse 11, God judgeth the righteous. Psalm 9, verse 7, the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. God is going to judge his own people first. Psalm 916, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. Have you ever heard stories about corrupt judges on the bench doing whatever they want to for political cronyism or paybacks or this judge over here in Illinois that got caught uh, overdosing the other judge on drugs come to find out that everybody that came into his court on a drug charge, he had already worked something out with them and if they didn't go along and give him drugs, he'd throw them in jail. I'm glad that judge is in jail right now. That tickles me to death when these judges get caught doing that stuff. And that stuff's probably more rampant than we want to recognize. But God is known by the way he judges people and the judgment that he executed. And if God let any one of us get by with disgusting, gross, terrible sins then God cannot judge the unrighteous. Judge me, O Lord, Psalm 35. Psalm 43, 43, 1, judge me, O God. Psalm 50, verse 4, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Psalm 51, 4, this is, da this is after David committed uh, uh, adultery with Bathsheba. You, know, you remember that story? He committed adultery with Bathsheba. She ended up pregnant. Her husband was out fighting David's battles on the battlefield. David called him in to try to cover up the pregnancy. The man would not go into his own wife because his men were out there fighting and bleeding to death out there on the battlefield, and he wouldn't do it. So he went back on the battlefield. And David told his captains, send Uriah the Hittite, front line of the battle. He's to receive an arrow before the sun goes down today. And David had his own soldier killed to cover up that pregnancy. So then he takes Bathsheba to be his wife, She's now going to have his baby. He thinks everything's fine now. And Nathan the prophet goes to him. David, let me tell you a story. There's a man that, oh, he had a lot of sheep. He had a lot of cattle. And he had a friend that came traveling by. And he was going to stay with him for a while. He didn't want to kill his own sheep. So he went to a poor man over here. Only had one lamb. Went and took that man's lamb. Stole it from him. Slaughtered it. Fed it to his friend. And David's sitting there going, are you kidding me? What is that guy, nuts? Nathan said, David, what do you think ought to be done to somebody like that? David said, boy, he ought to get it. Nathan looked at him and said, David, thou art the man. You stole your, one of your best soldiers' wives. And you had him killed to cover up the pregnancy. You know what happened after that? God forgave that sin. But the sword never left David's house. And it makes me think, the older I get, 
How many swords are left in my house because of things I've done in the past? Sometimes I don't think I can bear it. But God, if he's going to judge the rest of the world, he's got to judge me first. Before, I'll say it like this, before God deals with anybody in this church about anything you're doing wrong or anything that ain't right in your life, is it fair that God doesn't judge me or I don't let God apply that to me and just lay it on you? Is that fair? I'm here to tell you that here's one thing I've learned being a pastor. Before I give it to you, God has given it to me. And sometimes I've had to come out here and say things I did not want to say and confess things I did not want to confess and let everybody know God beat me to death over this message. It's not fair that I do it, you do it, that I get by with it and you don't. Ain't right. It ain't right. God's going to judge his people. So David said, let me read this for... Uh, second time, verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against thee, and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Now, I'm gonna, here's what I want to ask you. Whose reputation are you more concerned about? Yours or God's? I was going to tell you, don't answer it out loud. That is the right answer. Now let me let me say it. Let me phrase the question this way: Whose reputation should we be more interested in, us or God? But when we sin, whose reputation are we more interested in in preserving? We don't want to admit to anybody that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we made a mistake. We don't want to admit that we sinned. We don't want anybody finding it out. Let's try to hush this up and cover it up. And let's, let's just kind of leave it like that, like David tried to. The sword never left his house over it. When you can honestly come to a place in your life where you say truly in your heart, God, I never again want to embarrass you. I never want to bring shame and reproach in the name of Christ. I never want to hurt my church, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. So God, however you've got to deal with me and work in me and chasten stuff out of me, you have my blessing on it. Because God, you have done so much for me. I never want to bring shame to your name ever again. If you can bring yourself to that point, you're right with God. Here's what I know from the Bible, Scotty. If you judge yourself with God's judgment, God won't judge you. If you chasten yourself, God won't need to. Amen? So let's I want to make a let's kind of get uncomfortable here for a minute. Bear with me, okay? It's not going to take long, but I just I want to make some points here. So, you know somebody that all oh, they're, they're drunks, they're liquor drinkers. After work, where are they going to go? Going to go to the bar, going to go to the pool hall, going to stop off at the convenience mart, get a big six pack, guzzle it down on the way home, and right before they get to the house, stop at another place and get some more and go in and sit down and drink all night. Lay out all night at pool halls, lay out all night drunk. Getting drunk, drinking in front of everybody, and you say, yeah, that's, that's his problem right there. He's got too much liquor. He's got liquor in his life. He needs to, God, you need to judge that guy. He's got liquor. He's driving drunk. He needs to go to prison. So here's what I'm saying. It would be right if the exact same measure of judgment that you have for somebody that you know that's drinking liquor, that you apply to yourself for your own liquor drinking. Or, somebody in your family, their marriage busting up because 
the wife or the husband been on the internet all day long and they're sleezing around places that they shouldn't be on the internet. And you see disaster coming. And you say, I, I, I tell you what, I, I, I used to like old Jim. I mean, he was a good brother-in-law. But all, I mean, all that chasing women I know he's doing and all that pornography he's got on his computer and all those magazines he's got and all that stuff, ah, that's going to kill him. I tell you what, if I, if I was my sister, I'd leave that guy. So that same judgment should then be rolled on yourself for your own nasty, filthy lust problem that you have just like your brother-in-law does. What else can we, can we name about our neighbors that we know they do? Yeah. I know so-and-so, they go to that church over there, they don't use King James. I tell you what, I'm around him all the time, and he's just one F word after another. I mean, every time he talks, he's just cursing up a storm. And I know he goes over here to this church over here. That, that probably His problem is they don't have a King James Bible. That's why he curses all that time. And then you went home, and you got mad at the kids, and you let them have it. The same judgment that you want applied to everybody else for what they're doing wrong should land right on you. Is that right? Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 2. What other sins can I come up with? Somebody name something that your neighbors do that ain't right. I don't, you don't have to name your neighbor's name. Huh? You had good neighbors. I don't believe you for a second. <laughs> Melissa, my sister said, talk about my mom. I live next door to her, so I got nothing. And I'm going, I don't believe that for a second. No, we got more on her, Melissa, than anybody else in the world, I guarantee you. Yeah. I'm going to let Romans 2 say to you what God wants to say. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Did you catch that? Let me tell you about the Levite priest. I've told this before, I love it. God, God dealt with me about this. Man and his family is bringing their, bringing their sheep, bringing a, a, pr a priceless lamb to the tabernacle to be slain for their sin. When the Levite priest takes that sacrifice, before, before he offers the sacrifice for that family, he must offer a sacrifice for his own sins first. Now think about how bad it is when the religious hierarchy, the pious holy men with the robes and the doctorates and the big bookshelves and all of that stuff, how they lord over the congregation and put them under bondages and rules and regulations and judgments all the time while they themselves get away with everything. Did you know that the Pope has a confessor? The Pope has to go to confession and confess his sins to another priest. And the Vatican is wicked. Shouldn't it be that way with us? We are kings and priests with Jesus Christ. And here the world, here the world is coming to us looking for salvation, looking for hope. And they stink like the world. They look like the world. They act like the world. They've got worldliness and sin all over them. But they want a Savior. And they walk into churches, and the churches take one look at them and say, Ah, they're not our kind. Preacher, they're not our kind. I tell you what, I think we ought to get them people out of here. They look, at, look how they dress. They're not in suit and ties like we are. Look at all these people. I mean, Pastor, don't you think we ought to... Maybe, go, maybe you ought to go over there and visit them, Pastor, and tell them that there's a church over closer to where they live. Do you know that kind of stuff goes on? Well, we've got some people in this church, I tell you, they're kind of an embarrassment to us. 
because they do things that are wrong and I just don't think people like that ought to be in church. Are you stupid? Those are the people that need to be here. And if you don't see that, there's lots of other churches you can go to. It's got to start here. So, verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. God, John, is not going to judge you over what your neighbor's doing in her house. God's not going to give you an easy ticket out simply because you're not doing her sin. God is going to get you for what you did. God is going to get you for what you did and me for what I did. And it doesn't matter what position you hold in the church. It doesn't matter how much you tithe. It doesn't matter how many services straight in a row you attended. None of that stuff matters. None of it matters. I grew up in church. I know church people. They're drunkards. They're dope fiends. They're whoremongers. They're full of lust and sodomy and fornication. They're full of thievery. They're full of jealousy and greed. I saw them. I watched them growing up. And then I became like them. And I said, God, I don't want this. This is your house. You gave, you gave, me, you gave me my church. I don't want to embarrass God ever again. I told Brother Jim Waymire. He was at the grave site, Sister Waymire, putting her in the ground. And he, Brother Waymire came to me. He said, Mike, I just want to tell you I appreciate you. He said, the stand you take for the Bible. He said, Mom was really proud of you. And I said, Brother Waymire, God dealt with me that instead of embarrassing your mother, I should honor your mother and start doing things the right way. God dealt with me about that. He's going to render every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Zero. Now, turn to Matthew. This is it. I'm done. Matthew chapter 18. So, Alicia and Melissa kind of get a song ready. We're going to have we have prayer time. Anybody wants to come to the altar, that's fine. But we'll have a song ready and you guys are going to go down in a little bit. Okay? But you got to hear this part. Everybody's got to hear this part before I can let you go eat. Matthew 18, 23. There, say amen. Are you reading it on the screen? Go ahead. Try it. Man, I love this. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. How many talents did he owe him? Ten thousand talents. Let's just say that that's $10,000. If you owed a debt right now, listen to me, if you owed a debt to somebody right now of $10,000 and they came to you today and they said, if you don't pay me today, I've had it, I'm going I'm to shoot you dead. 
How many of you could pay it? You have a sin debt that is far higher than $10,000. You know how long it takes to pay off a sin debt? Eternally. That's how great your sin is. And yet God forgave your debt. We're not done. So, verse 28, the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pennies. One dollar. hundred Kenya shillings. Owed him one dollar. Um, I can't read my script here. Same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What are you holding against people? What is it that you have not forgiven some people for and of? What is it that if you, if you had the opportunity, you'd have them by the throat and say, you owe me. Your father forgave you everything. You don't owe him a dime. You want your tithe money back? Come get it. It's yours. You don't owe God anything. So how dare us Look at anybody, saved or lost, and not give them the same measure of pity that God gave us. So if you want to, if you want to keep judging people, keep judging them. God's writing it all down. And at some point, God is going to render unto you the exact same judgment that you issued out to somebody else. Somebody you would not forgive. Somebody you said, you know what, they do that, they're part of this church, I think they ought to be run out of here! I think we all ought to be run out of here. It is by nothing but the grace of God that us wicked, hell-deserving, scumbag sinners get to come in here in the presence of God and have anything given to us free of charge. While we then turn around and look at everybody else and say, well, they're not worthy of our church. They're not worthy of being around me. They do this and they do that. When are we going to wake up and realize this? That's heavy on my heart. If we're going to, have, if we're going to, if we're going to do church, if we're going to have church, let's cut that stuff out. And when we have people come into this church that don't look like us, don't act like us, or whatever... Let's treat them the same way God treats us. Think we can do that? Think it's right? Let's bow our heads.